Welcome back to the Explanation Pro. Today I'll recap a war drama film based on the actual event that took place in December 1914 and the early days of the First World War called Joyeux Noël. Spoilers incoming. Schoolboys start to recite patriotic poems about their respective countries, regarding the conflict that has broken up between their countries. This signifies the breakout of the First World War. As the story truly begins, two Scottish brothers in a Catholic parish and a lone priest light liturgical candles, when suddenly one of the brothers rings the church bell upon hearing the announcement of the war. Enthusiastic about the prospect of war, the bell ringer William exclaims to his little brother Jonathan that they join the war. With this news in mind, the parish priest Palmer refuses to let the boys venture alone into the fields of northern France, and so he accompanies them as a Red Cross stretcher bearer. In an opera house in Berlin, a tenor performer by the name of Nikolaus Sprink gets disrupted by the entry of a German army officer. The officer proclaims that Germany is besieged by the enemy and needs service from his people. He requires that all able-bodied men be drafted onto the field of battle. On the front, a nauseous French lieutenant Adebert prepares himself and leaves with his aide-de-camp Ponchel from the barracks into the trenches with his battalion. He then commands them to retake a farm that the Germans have captured a hundred meters from their frontier. With assistance from the Royal Scots, they begin climbing up from their trenches and charge into no man's land. As the Germans gun down the charging French and Scotsman troops, the decimation of the charging joint allies is all that takes place, wherein William dies in the process. Jonathan sits helplessly as he watches his brother passing in his own hands, feeling guilty for seemingly abandoning him. Night descends, and just by the outskirts of the Scottish trench, Father Palmer tends to the wounds of an injured serviceman. A voice from outside the trench reaches the clergyman, begging to be rescued from no man's land. With the father deeming it an obligation to aid those in need, despite orders that no man leaves the trench, the cleric jumps for the dying man post-haste. Unfortunately, one Scotsman tries to stop him and ends up shot by the Germans across. And so the churchman tells him to abandon his initial task much to the misfortune of the poor man he tried to save from danger. Back in the French encampment, Adebert discusses with the major general in charge of their ongoing situation against the Germans, alongside the status of the French village they've captured. He also questions the well-being of the inhabitants of the village, among them being his pregnant wife. Once the general assures him that she's safe and is treated well by the Germans, he begins discussing a vacant position, but the lieutenant declines his offer. In Germany, while the Germans naively suggest the idea that this war will be over by Christmas, they prepare to send off Christmas trees to the front lines. A Danish woman appears as Anna Sorensen, a mezzo-soprano, by the permission of the Kronprinz, the son and heir of the German emperor. She requests a German officer in charge for a certain spring as she explains that she and the tenor are running late for a recital for his majesty, and thus Nikolaus is allowed to leave the front lines and is recalled. At the French trench, Audibert has a haircut provided by private Ponchel whilst they banter. The barber recounts that beyond the farm the Germans occupied was the village where his mother and the lieutenant's wife currently reside. The officer's aide claims he can get there in an hour on foot while getting emotional over being so close yet so far from his home. During the recital, in front of His Highness, both Nikolaus and Anna steady themselves in front of their audience. However, despite Sorensen delivering an initially successful chant, Sprink cracks his voice, likely out of stage fright, which prompts the instrumentals complimenting their performance to stop. But after taking some time to breathe, they continue and finally conclude their score, entertaining the royalty and his colleagues. After their near-perfect performance, Anna, fully aware that staying unseparated from her fiancé cannot last any longer with the current circumstances they're in, requests to come with him on the front lines. Reluctant to accept her proposal, Nikolaus eventually agrees when she pretty much gives him no other choice if it means both of them spending time together. Nikolaus states that if they remain together, they must sing together as well for their troops at the frontier. Christmas Eve approaches, and the Scotsmen within their snow-fallen entrenchment sing songs of jolly and play their bagpipes in celebration of the upcoming holiday. At the German trenches, however, a distressed Lieutenant Hortzmeyer is approached by the acting duet, questioning the presence of Anna in the trenches. When Sprink attempts to convince the lieutenant that their presence is under the permission of the Kronprinz, the officer simply agrees to his terms. While the Scots play their traditional music, the Christmas trees the entrenched Germans received from their fatherland were put on display just above their dugouts. Simultaneously, from the French embankment, Lieutenant Adebert orders a soldier, Gusselin, 
to survey the German trenches of their machine gun positions. As he does this, he witnesses the Germans decorating their wartime abode and shelter. The French see the Germans' display of the Christmas spirit, and mistake it for something far more ominous. Back in their trench dugout, Sprink sings for his comrades the German version of Silent Night. His singing is recognizable from their distance, and upon familiarizing the melody, Father Palmer's being the Scotsman he is with his bagpipe, begins to play along with his tune. Hearing this as well, Sprink, despite being called out by the German lieutenant, climbs out of the German trench carrying a Tannenbaum into no man's land. As Nikolaus stands in no man's land, he mistakenly greets the Scottish for Englishmen, while the French watch in both confusion. Hortzmeyer follows Sprink, and tells him that he's nowhere near the Berlin Opera, but Nikolaus retorts by saying this isn't Berlin, and performing in such a setting does not compare. While all of this happens, both Scottish and French lieutenants also attend the ongoing commotion. The soldiers from all sides went out of their way to expect any amount of respite from this hell of a war. No man's land suddenly becomes crowded with men from three different nations. Exchanging thoughts and drinks with snacks, a shred of humanity takes place among these men of war who, just a while ago, were shooting at each other. However, when one German soldier tries to offer a doubtful Jonathan some champagne, he retains his distance, still deeming the Germans hostile. The three military men and the trooper begin to talk about a ceasefire for Christmas Eve, a truce. Under the impression that the outcome of this great war won't be decided this night, or any night sooner for just one special night, requesting that they should lay down their arms. As Adebert grabs champagne from his trench, and the three salute and greet the holiday in each other's tongues, his French troops assume the Germans are surrendering. The German and French lieutenants continue their exchange while Lieutenant Gordon remains in the background. Adebert recounts the loss of his wallet that bears the image of his pregnant wife. To cope, he procures himself a drawing of his wife instead, although it's nowhere close to being the same. Suddenly, Hortzmeyer pulls the Frenchman's wallet out of his jacket and recalls that he found it during an assault against the French, and that it has an address etched onto it. With this, Adebert thanks Hortzmeyer. He discusses what he currently knows about his wife's pregnancy with Anna, saying there were complications. Growing concern over the well-being of his wife and upcoming child, this war has done nothing but prevent him from having the chance of being a father. Sorensen suggests writing to her, but he replies that he doesn't receive letters himself, alongside the front being impassable to handwritten communication. He has no clue if his child is even a boy or a girl, or even alive. Being the only priest present in the area, Palmer now acts as a chaplain and gathers everyone around as he prepares for a low mass performed in Latin for Christmas Eve. The scene grows quiet until the cleric assigns Anna to chant for the sacred ritual. Her magnificently soothing voice as she performs the Ave Maria as if she were in the Berlin Opera House with everyone witnessing something unique and talented. All of a sudden, explosions from a faraway battlefield remind them they're still at war. Once the mass concludes, Hortzmeyer reveals to Anna he's Jewish after her impression of everyone. Regardless of their differences, for one moment in time, everyone manages to be together. Even if Christmas meant nothing to someone like Hortzmeyer, he along with everyone else involved cannot forget what has taken place tonight. On Christmas morning, the soldiers play football and make further exchanges despite language barriers, and the three lieutenants drink their morning coffee together. The Germans, however, suspect that one of the Scots is plotting something against the Germans, revealing that it is just poor Jonathan. Upon discovering the corpse of his brother, he attempts to bury him amid the muddy snow. This gesture warrants the commanding officers that they bury their dead and the only available padre in the area to tend to their souls through prayer. Anna and Nikolaus return to the German trench, much to the surprise of their lieutenant. He asks them as to why they were still there, wherein the couple lies about it. The lieutenant breaks it to them, however, that headquarters called him five minutes ago and they claim Sprink has fled. When the commanding officer tells them the artist was with his fiance at the front, Sprink was to be arrested. Now the couple thinks of leaving, initially at the Danish border, but finally settling as prisoners of war for the French. Later on, Hortzmeyer warns the French and Scots that their artillery will begin shelling them by 10 am, and advises all of them that they seek refuge in his trench. As the shelling is over, Lieutenant Gordon claims that with such bombardment, it would only make sense for his own Foss's artillery to return fire. So, they return the Germans' gesture, and all of them take solace in their trenches as well. Departing after the shelling, the Scots, in their last display of humanity, play Auld Lang Syne through their bagpipes for the enemy they had been with the night before. Despite all of that, orders were still followed, 
and Gusselin finally gives Adebert the locations of the German machine guns, now that the time for peace is coming to an end. Out of their knowledge, however, Anna and Nikolaus enter the French entrenchment, insisting Adebert be the one that arrests them instead, which he does when they request that the lieutenant deliver some letters for them. As Palmer tends to the wounded in an infirmary, he receives an unexpected visit from his bishop and is recalled back into Scotland for what he has done. The father protests, but his superior pays no heed to him. When the bishop delivers a mass for the new Scottish recruits, he delivers an anti-German homily. He calls them inhumane, misquoting Matthew chapter 10 verse 34 in its entirety. Overhearing this breaks the heart of the clergyman who witnessed one of the most unique moments of a fraternity at this point in time. In a fit of disappointment, he hangs up his pectoral cross and leaves. Now with new recruits, and under a new commanding officer replacing Gordon's superiority over the Scottish regiment, these soldiers are oblivious to what has taken place the previous night. And when what appears to be a German soldier climbing out of his trench, a resentful Jonathan shoots him. To the surprise of the new Scots, the French lieutenant, and the man shot, was actually his aide-de-camp Ponchel disguised as a German soldier. To which the officer weeps for the death of his comrade. Later on, the Major General from earlier recalls Adebert and learns through letters sent in by soldiers of what has happened. They punish his inferior by sending him to the renowned French front of Verdun. Learning through Ponchel who went to the German-occupied village just before passing on that his wife gave birth to his son whom she names Henri, he says that the General is a grandfather now. Even though General Adebert already knows about this, they exclaim that they will survive this war for him. On the German side, the regiment under the command of Hortzmeyer is disbanded by the Kronprinz himself, who addresses them himself in a train carriage bound for the Eastern Front, where they get relocated. Regardless of this news, and after such a once-in-a-lifetime experience, one of the soldiers hums in the carriage a Christmas carol as the train begins moving. As it speeds up, his comrades join him in murmuring the holiday tune, with the Christmas spirit never leaving them. In a war that proclaims to end all wars, where everyone calls for the death of the other, one Christmas Eve is left unique in a conflict that lasts over four years. For a time, soldiers serving under their flags see each other not as men of war, but as fellow humans who share a cause. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video please hit the like button and also subscribe my channel for more videos like this. See you in the next video.